called the last man. And this is the people that choose to minimize pain and maximize comfort throughout their life, which is the majority of our population around the world. It's a boring life, but it's a safe life for most people. And, uh, and that's what they want. For me, for my clients, none of them want that. My clients want to truly live the experience and, and push those limits of human potential to see what's possible. What does it take to do the impossible? What does it take to level up your game like never before? What does it take for individuals, organizations, for even institutions to achieve paradigm shifting? Nothing is ever the same again. Great things. Our mission is to decode the neurobiology of flow and cognitive peak performance. Access the minds of maverick scientists, groundbreaking innovators, and world-leading experts to understand what it takes to achieve ultimate human performance. So you can feel your best, perform your best, and accomplish your boldest goals. I'm your host, Rian Doris, and together with best-selling author Stephen Kotler, I present to you Flow Research Collective Radio. Dr. Daniel Stickler, welcome to Flow Research Collective Radio. Really great to have you here. It's exciting to be here and uh, really dive into the topics I'm, I'm so excited about. Super, super. Yeah, I'm going to give you a quick uh, intro so that everyone who's listening has, has full context on, on you and all the things that you have, have done and accomplished here. So you are an MD, a future-focused visionary and human potential evolutionary thought leader. Um, and you're the co-founder and chief medical officer of the Apiron Center for Human Potential and chief science officer for Apiron Academy. Um, and you've been a pioneer behind systems-based precision performance medicine, which is a new paradigm that redefines medicine from the old symptoms-based disease model to one of limitless peak performance in all aspects of life. You're a physician to high-performing executives and entrepreneurs who want to upgrade their current state, along with being an author, a speaker, a blogger, and a podcaster. And you're also the medical director for the Neurohacker Collective, which I know a lot of our clients know of, a Google consultant for wearable technology, epigenetics, and AI in healthcare, and a guest lecturer at Stanford University on epigenetics in clinical practice. So... Yeah, amazing bio litany of different accomplishments and, and really fascinating fields that you played at the intersection of. So yeah, really appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today. And to kick us off, I wanted to read a quote that I, that I found from doing my research before this interview. And that goes, stress is not a bad thing at all. Stress can be an amazing factor for performance. However, when the stressor is removed, you want to be able to go back to the calm state to recharge and be able to go back at it again. And we see a lot of people having a difficult time trying to go back to a state of a calm baseline and gradually accumulate more stress throughout the day. That's when decision fatigue sets in. So I would love a little bit more context on how you think about stress and effective stress management in lieu of that quote. Yeah, I mean, I, I really think people should embrace stress. Uh, they should look at it as a performance enhancer in that, that regard, because that's the way it can be used. It's just most people aren't looking at it that way, so they don't have access to being able to do it that way. And once you understand the benefits of stressing the body, I mean, you know, everything we do, I mean, take exercise. It's the, it, it will create the most stressful response in the body in the course of a week, uh, a session of exercise. And yet we know that's healthy for us, right? And so what's happening is, um, so the body, and we call this the familiar zone. So there's this little zone where the body fluctuates in, you know, a little sine wave through this zone. And there's an upper border and a lower border. This is where we are in our everyday lives and saying, you know, I can handle anything within this zone. What happens is you, when you stress, you take little excursions outside of that zone. And the more times you do that, the body goes, wow, I need to adapt because this environment is different than the environment I was in. 
So suddenly the body upgrades itself to a higher uh, zone being the familiar zone. We see this a lot with people that go through weight loss programs. So uh, let's say they're sedentary, they eat poorly. So they go on a diet, they start exercising and for three months, they've lost 20 pounds. And then the next three months, they continue doing the same workouts and eating healthy and their weight doesn't budge. And they're like, you know, what happened here? And what it is, is this is epigenetics at work. The, the body adapts, it adjusts um, the functioning of genes, of the proteome, all of this in order to adapt to that new style to make it your new normal, I guess is the best way to say it. Um, but we see this with every aspect of, of human life. I mean, we are defined as a human system. We are a complex adaptive system. And that means we adapt as we go through life and, and we have emergence of new properties. So the emergence of a new state. And this is what we do when we, we stress the body. I mean, you know, you think about, um, you just think about vegetables. I mean, most people will tell you vegetables are healthy, but what they don't realize is vegetables are also toxic in the body. But that's one of the benefits of them. This is the hormetic effect where the phytosterols get in the bloodstream, go to the liver. The liver says, whoa, this is not a healthy sterile and they have to detoxify it. So what it does is it causes the liver to upregulate the um, CYP450 enzymes that detoxify the body. Well, when it's upregulated, it can cleanse the blood even better. So it's actually doing a positive thing for the body by doing so. It's a great breakdown. Vegetables are actually a fascinating example as well. You've talked a lot, Dan, about the difference between performance medicine and sick care. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if you could give us a breakdown on, on what you see as the problems with the conventional healthcare system and then how you define and think about the other lens and approach you're bringing to the table, which is performance medicine. Yeah, and I, I really didn't understand systems and the human system when I was in medical school. Um, I learned the anatomy, the physiology, the biochemistry. I learned all about the liver and the heart. You know, we learned about individual pieces within that. Um, but nothing was about creating a, a more enjoyable life for people. It was all about let's, let's postpone death as long as we can, but it's a stepwise drop that you just try to slow down. And uh, that didn't go well for me. So I ended up going into general and vascular surgery, did that for about 10 years, but I started doing uh, what was called back then age management medicine, where it was the only form of medicine I knew of that was about taking you know, pretty normal or healthy people and helping to boost them to a higher level of function. And so uh, after doing that for a couple of years, I just said, this is what I want to do. This is, this is the way medicine was supposed to be practiced. And um, I just walked away from surgery one day and I said, I'm done and started, uh, started this, this company with my wife. Um, and you know, it's been a, a passion of ours to really help change the medical paradigm because we're in a paradigm where we look at a very linear uh, aspect of this system. And, you know, in, in simple and, and complicated systems, linear is the way it goes. So you have this system going to this system. So if you double this input, you double this output over here, that's the, the simple or complicated system. And that works fine for like airplanes, robots, whatever you're, you're dealing with from a programmable aspect, but the human system, it's complex, adaptable. And when you look at the definition of that, everything is about interrelationships, uh, interdependence of all these different systems within the body. And you need to take all of that into consideration. I mean, you know, we know this just like if we give epinephrine, well, we can give epinephrine and the heart will increase. Now, if we give twice the amount of epinephrine, does it double? No, it doesn't double at all. Uh, in fact, it barely goes up much higher. And that's because there's local feedback mechanisms 
at the heart level. And each organ system and subsystems within those have feedback loops and they get input from a dozen, sometimes hundreds of different areas that are, they have to summate the signal there. So you never get an output that is um, directly uh, correlated with a, a input in that regard. And that's one of the problems I had with, uh, with the mantra of functional medicine, which I got into because I saw it as an alternative to you know, the current system um, of algorithmic medicine. But what I found is that in functional medicine, there was a lot of uh, disease care. It was just done with supplements and all that, it wasn't about increasing performance and keeping, I mean, my feeling is, and it's the feeling in most of the age rejuvenation industry is, you know, what is the one thing that we can do that make, will make a huge difference in, in diseases in the future? And that's to optimize the system now, uh, make the system so it's anti-fragile. So when it hits stress, not only does it just survive and get back to baseline, it actually gets stronger through that. And, you know, that's, that's our philosophy in approaching uh, really the, the human body aspects of optimization. Amazing. Thank you for that breakdown, Dan. I think a lot of people get a little bit confused about all the different terms that can come before medicine. So I'd love to get a clarification from you because you hear about functional medicine, you hear about concierge medicine, which I think actually just refers to a business model. You hear about regenerative medicine, performance medicine, obviously conventional medicine. What are what is the full set of categories there? And, and it'd be really helpful just to get a bit of a breakdown on the, on what distinguishes each from each. Yeah, so so conventional medicine is evidence based medicine, which is a good thing, um, but it's very linear. You know, and that's why we have algorithms and that's why we have standards of care now. But the thing is, the body doesn't behave by an algorithm. It just, you know, you can get close, you can get some probabilities, but it's not going to be absolute. It's just like when we have a blood pressure medication that's approved for blood pressure, a lot of people assume, oh, it's approved for blood pressure, so it'll work for me. Well, it may work for 80% of people who try it, but there's going to be 20% that won't have much of a response or have a negative response from it. So it's not that just because it's, it's approved by the, the standard of care doesn't necessarily mean it's right for you. I mean, each of us is an individual. I mean, think about this. When you look at research, uh, when they do animal research, they are doing research on what's called a monoclonal line of rats or mice. This means that every one of them has identical DNA. <laughs> They're raised in the exact same environment. They're fed the exact same meals. So it's one individual. And when we look at humans, this is why nutritional studies are so poorly um, indicative of, of what's good or bad. Um, but we're all different. We all have different contexts. And, and this is what people miss is the context of you as a person versus the context of you. And you want to take that into account. You want to individualize. I mean, this is all this end of one stuff where we, we can use current research to get probabilities, but it's not an, uh, it's not an absolute truth. Uh, so that's where traditional medicine is or, or current medicine. Functional medicine, uh, they claim to be a more holistic approach is, is the approach and they are. They're, they're definitely more complete of looking at contributions of other organ systems and all of that, but the the thing that I, I emphasize with people is they are not necessarily about making the system better when it's fine. You know, when you're normal, what can you do? It's just not something that's, that's brought up in discussion. And they have the, the mantra of look for the root cause. But um, by defining the system as a complex adaptive system, there is no root cause. It can't be. Uh, so in complexity medicine, we say when you focus on the roots, you miss the contributions of the soil and you have to take into account the entire aspect. I mean, think about the human being. I mean, we can say holistic where we're looking at mind, body, spirit, but that comes up short too, because we're not looking at the environment and the biosphere that we're living in and how that actually impacts us. Uh, so that's where I, I kind of found functional medicine fell short. Then there's anti-aging medicine. And that, um, that one, 
you know, that's where I first got into it. But what I found with that is that was more about, um, you know, it just was not complete. It was, it was fitness, nutrition, which were great, uh, and hormone replacement uh, for low hormones. But that's about where it ended. There was not much in the way of lifestyle work. Um, there was not much, I mean, and lifestyle. I mean, when we look at our medical practice, um, lifestyle is 90% of the work we do. You know, the, the peptides, the medications, the uh, technology we use, I mean, that, uh, that's just secondary. Lifestyle is first and foremost. In fact, I think there was a study done not too long ago that they said biosocial um, factors were the biggest predictor of longevity when compared with their, every other biomarker. Um, so the, uh, the biosocial aspects were uh, so important, but it's never addressed. Then you have the regenerative medicine and regenerative medicine is more of the people that are using the stem cells. Um, they typically will call themselves regenerative uh, medicine practitioners and they're injecting uh, stem cells. Sometimes they'll inject peptides, sometimes they'll inject uh, medications, sometimes they'll inject exosomes, um, but that's what they're essentially doing is doing a lot of um, processes that are designed to rejuvenate specific tissue. And, and then you have the age rejuvenation industry. And this one uh, is where I kind of sit right now where we look at age rejuvenation as the ultimate um, way to go to take care of everything all in one swoop. Um, it's, it's just, um, you know, are you gonna, let's say you come in and say, oh, we're gonna put you on this heart prevention diet. Well, what about the kidneys? What about the liver? What about the digestive tract? What about the cognitive function? Um, and, and it may be all good for those, but to, to specifically address that, and this is the problem in a complex adaptive system, um, experts are not the top person. You know, our, our saying is we want deep generalists and we want people that can look at the landscape of all this stuff and see how it comes together, the relationships, not the specifics. Um, you keep experts on tap but not on top. So you use them as reference within the system. But this is why, you know, even the, and this is coming from me, who was a general ambassador surgeon, the, the medical generalist is, should be the highest paid person in the system. They're the ones that can integrate everything. But the way it's worked now is they're not paid well enough. They have too many clients. So they send people to a specialist and the way it should work is the specialist sends recommendations back to the gatekeeper. But what they do is they just put people on it. And, you know, if you're a cardiologist, your goal is that this person not die of a cardiac issue. You know, it's not that they're saying, damn the kidneys, I'm going to put you on this medication. They're just saying, oh, I know this medication works really well for, for the heart and what we're trying to treat uh, without even really thinking about the fact that they might have some renal insufficiency or they might have uh, had some markers that would suggest that. Um, so really that, that gatekeeper is the key in the medical system. And it, you know, for me, it doesn't have to be a physician either. You know, there's a ton of physician extenders out there, the PAs, the nurse practitioners, but there's also health coaches that can work under licensed medical people and they, you know, like I said, 90% of what we do is lifestyle coaching. Why don't we start using health coaches to do the, the, the coaching for people and getting their lifestyles lined up and the, and the docs are overseeing it, but they step in when they need a medication or something uh, bigger to impact the system. I love that breakdown. It's the first time I've heard those all uh, differentiated. So I appreciate that. So when it comes to performance medicine or um, age rejuvenation, let's just say hypothetically, you are someone who, for whom you know, money is not necessarily no object, but less of an object, and you want to maximize your performance, your mood, your cognition, your energy levels, even aesthetic elements, and you're willing to put in the time, and the resources, what would be 
an example of a of a protocol there assuming again assuming there's actually no active complaint besides just knowing that you don't feel your your best i'm curious what some of the tools are what what an 80 20 yeah that's like the, that's a deep question that's a lot of stuff um you know what what we do with people is we work with with all lifestyle aspects so sleep nutrition fitness um environmental health um hormones and we collect data i mean we just we get as much data as we can and we try to create a picture of this is the human system in this state in this moment uh, a lot of people like to attach to stories and stories are just good and they're good because they give you a background but they i try to get people to get rid of the stories of why they are in the state that they're in now because i'm assessing current state what's the system look like and what can we do for it um but we use, I mean, we use extensive battery tests from um, blood tests, urine tests. Um, we do um, epigenetic testing for methylation age. We check the Dunedin rate of aging score. We do glycan age testing. Uh, we're just getting ready to add proteomics uh, to our assessments. Uh, we have a cancer test that screens for 50 plus cancers just from a blood sample. Um, and we map the brain. We get a full clinical grade EEG on every client. And that's been beneficial lately because uh, people with the post COVID brains, it's been a significant issue um, with our clients. And we've been able to see what their brains looked like before they got COVID and then after COVID. And uh, there are significant impacts. I mean, if somebody's saying, you know, I just don't feel like I'm thinking the same way or my thought processing. Uh, my wife was saying, you know, I, I can't find words for stuff sometimes. And so we do a, a neuromodulation with them with, uh, with brain stimulation to, to try to recreate uh, a baseline state or enhance state that they're in. Um, but we do a DEXA scan for, for body composition and for bone density. We do a neuromuscular mapping of the whole body to see how each muscle group is firing and if it's doing it the right way. So yeah, I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> it's a lot of data. Um, the other thing we do is all of our clients are given a Garmin Phoenix watch. Uh, and I have no relationship with Garmin uh, other than being a, a medical provider that gets a discount when, when I get it for my patients. Um, but the Garmin has been one of the greatest tools that we've ever encountered for dealing with optimizing people. Um, we get on our practitioners, uh, get on a call once a month with each of their clients. And in that we pull up their Garmin dashboard and we're looking at the month and we're saying, you know, what happened this week with the sleep, the sleep structure was off or, you know, the, um, the stress, why was the stress so high? I mean, I can, I can tell every client exactly which nights they had alcohol because I can see the change in the stress and the recovery. Um, I mean, one, even one glass of alcohol shoots stress through the roof and the recovery, which is designed to onset at sleep, just doesn't have the ability to do it when the stress is that high. So they wake up the next day and not only did they not get great sleep, but they also didn't recover. And so we monitor their recovery scores and make sure that they don't go and stress the system um, when they're already pretty depleted. Uh, but we can look at their resting heart rate. I mean, we, we could, when people will call us and say they got COVID, I can look back at their data and say, oh yeah, I noticed this is when it started to happen about three to four days before they even had symptoms. We could see it in the metrics that they had. Their heart rate would go up. Uh, oxygen saturations at night would start to drop a little bit. Um, and sure enough, their stress levels went through the roof by the third day. And, and that's when they start showing symptoms. But wow. it's, you know, that's it. I mean, we get every, all this data and then we present it to our whole team and everybody on the team contributes. And our team includes an anesthesiologist, a nephrologist, um, a, a primary care physician, um, a nurse practitioner, a PA and a dietitian and a psychologist. Um, this is a big piece that I haven't really talked about is the, uh, the biopsychosocial aspects of life. Our biggest metric in knowing whether the person is getting benefit is what's called the quality of life score. And this assesses areas of like health, love, 
uh, relationships, children, family, community, uh, learning, creativity, all of this. And every year we look to improve on that quality of life score. And that's, we've consistently done that. I've only had, geez, in probably almost 20 years, I've only had maybe four or five that went down uh, in that, even during COVID. I mean, the people were coming in still, they were improving over the previous year. So that, that's a great metric for me to look at. Mm, that's really interesting. I want to come back for a second to the Garmin Phoenix watch. I actually haven't heard people mention that specific wearable that often. And I'm curious if you have found it to be superior in certain ways to the whoop strap or the aura ring or other wearable wearables, because I know people will find that really interesting. Does it have heart rate variability? And yeah, how, how does it compare in your experience to whoop aura Apple watch? Well, with all of these metrics, uh, the one thing to keep in mind is they are not absolute metrics, but we're using them as a dynamic. You know, you can say this is my uh, heart rate variability, but you know the 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 watches, the rings, their the wristbands, they're using uh, pulse plethysmography in order to determine this. So it's an indirect measure, and uh, sometimes you know when we do a clinical grade. HRV assessment in the office, uh, it, it can be very different from what we're seeing on the wearable devices. But what is important about it is to look at consistency and dynamics. So, you know, here's their baseline. You know, if their stress averages 27 every day, stress score on the Garmin, and then suddenly they're hitting 45, you know, we've got a problem, something's going on. Same with rest and heart rate. I mean, I can look at my rest and heart rate over the last um, five years because I've, I've worn this continuously. I don't have it on right now because my watch actually lost its communication with the phone <laughs> and I had to send it back for repairs. So I'm waiting for that. And it's crazy how attached you get to the data. I mean, after five years of collecting data and not having any, it's, it's, it's a little freeing actually, but uh, I still miss the data. But this is the dynamic, you know, is your sleep, are you getting more deep sleep now? You know, I'm not saying that the deep sleep was accurate to the exact deep sleep that you get, but the fact that your deep sleep is improving, that tells me something's working. Heart rate's coming down, but I mean, heart rate, if you look at resting heart rate across the board, I mean, most people years and years will fall into about the same average uh, for themselves. And then something takes them out of that. And that's when we pay attention and we say, okay, something's happening here. In comparison to um, Aura and Whoop, uh, so the data content of the Garmin is what I love. I mean, they, they did this with uh, using First Beats technology, uh, which is probably the most accurate uh, in the field right now. Uh, different, different pieces are more accurate on different things. Uh, like. The bio strap is really the best sleep one that I've seen so far. Uh, although we're, we're working with the Muse S also to see because, you know, that's got a high correlation with polysomnography. Um, and I've worn, I've worn three wearables simultaneously for weeks at a time to compare data. And, and they're, they're very different. Uh, Whoop, I found was um, uh, very different. And I'm not saying which one's better. It's just, you got to focus on dynamic and not, not look at it and say, oh, this is exactly right. No, it may not be because it's an indirect measure overall. Got it. That makes, that makes sense. And definitely will be interesting for folks to check out the bio strap as well. That looks compelling. Um, thanks for that breakdown, Dan. And then the next, the next question I have for you is with respect to tools within this space that are more on the medical intervention side, I would love to get a, a similar breakdown there around the different buckets they fall into and just what the what the menu looks like because as i was mentioning before we started recording people hear about peptides they hear about ozone they hear about uh, stem cells and exosomes and all these different things so i'm not sure if there's some way that you think about these different tools in terms of categories if so maybe you could give us a breakdown of that otherwise would love just a breakdown of you know what is on the uh, the age rejuvenation menu with you know folks yeah, that, like yourselves it, it varies a lot by the individual um, you know the some we have three categories so we have foundational 
work that we do, we have biospecific work that we do, and then we have enhancement or uh, optimization work. And so those are the three categories, even in our supplement store. I mean, each of the supplements is labeled according to those categories. So foundation, that's the thing everybody should be doing. Uh, biospecific is, you know, oh, your genetics indicate this or your lab work ind indicates this. We've got to work on this piece of, um, of health. Um, we have the, um, the performance line of the supplements, and those are for taking somebody who's at a baseline and enhancing what, where they are from a healthy standpoint. They're, they're in a point of health, but we're going to improve upon that. So um, when it comes to age rejuvenation, I mean, there's so many things that are on the market right now that are showing promise with that. I mean, the biggest movers, I think, right now from the medication standpoint would be rapamycin and, um, and desatinib. Um, so rapamycin, it hits several of the hallmarks of aging, but the biggest thing we've noticed with rapamycin is it rejuvenates a lot of uh, uh, the skin. It uh, works with really well with um, inflammation in the body, especially ones related to things like in the joint space. So as we age, we, we accumulate what we call senescent cells, they're zombie cells that, that are in each organ system. And these cells take up resources, even though they're not functioning anymore as to the type of cell that they should be, they're taking up resources and not putting out any production. In fact, they're actually putting out more toxic elements they call SASPs. And they've recently found that these SASPs are a major contributor to the uh, pain and inflammation with arthritis. And I've, I've seen that, you know, I had, from all those years of surgery, I got a little arthritic uh, discomfort in my, my wrist right below the thumb. And uh, when I started on rapamycin, it went away, which was good uh, end of one for me. And then desatinib, uh, we use that in combination with quercetin. You just do uh, basically three days a week for three weeks, twice a year. Uh, that's been shown in a lot of data on this. Uh, they were talking about 30% reduction in the body of these senescent cells. It's in a class called senolytics. Uh, and that's a big category because, I mean, that is so huge in, in, in really reversing a lot of the aging process. Um, and, you know, metformin is there, but it's, it's been the darling of the age rejuvenation industry, but it's kind of fallen a little bit towards uh, working with uh, things like uh, desatinib. And then we have, you know, some really cool peptides out there, like, um, you know, semaglutide is a big one right now for people to lose weight. I mean, I've, it's a paradigm changer for weight loss. The, the semaglutide has has created a whole new category for uh, weight loss interventions. And, you know, we use this in people even that, you know, they're 25% body fat, but they want to get to 15. We can use this for a month or two and they do great. I mean, it's a once a week injection. Um, and the other thing it does though, is it's an insulin sensitizer. So when we sensitize insulin receptors, we lower blood sugar levels, which is a positive thing for aging. And that's what we're trying to achieve. Uh, so there's some people looking at semaglutide now as an aging intervention. Um, the one I'm most excited about right now, though, is young plasma or plasmapheresis. So um, we just got approved to, to do a study uh, here in Texas um, where we're going to have access to young plasma to infuse into people. And we're also looking at getting a, a plasmapheresis machine since we have a nephrologist as one of our docs. Uh, so in plasma apheresis is where you actually draw off blood, spin it down, remove the, the plasma layer, and then rehydrate the blood cells with, um, with artificial uh, plasma, which is essentially albumin and, uh, and ringer's lactate and then put those cells back in the body so that the person doesn't lose any red blood cells, but they're, we're replacing their plasma in there. Uh, this is huge though. I mean, we're seeing huge changes in methylation age and rate of aging scores with people that go through these processes. And this is our best way of measuring you know, biologic age right now is the methylation age clocks or the, uh, the Dunedin rate of aging is it's my favorite to really look at. 
but you know, you could even start thinking about let's take off this plasma and then let's reinfuse with young plasma, not just um, synthetic plasma. What will that do? Or even adding exosomes from uh, amniotic fluid back in to what you're putting back in. And the reason for all of this, uh, the convoys um, were researchers at Stanford and his husband and wife team. They hooked an old rat and a young rat circulation together. And this was back in 2009 or 10, I believe. And the old rat got younger, got rejuvenated. And so that sent them on a course in, over the last 12, 13 years of finding why that happened. And they've isolated it down to factors that are in the plasma. And as we age, we gradually start secreting more factors that are telling the cells in the body to age. It's like a programmed aging that we're seeing. And it's saying, you know, let's not function optimally. Let's not repair as well as we used to. And some people say that's a process because of the accumulation of cell and DNA damage that's occurring that we're doing that. But it's also why we're aging. And um, this whole new area of, um, of this rejuvenation through plasma factors, I mean, it's huge right now. A lot of researchers in it. Uh, some of the, the really cutting edge stuff is now on uh, cellular reprogramming. So going in and actually reprogramming cells to, uh, to behave in a younger uh, style. Uh, that's that one. I mean, you know, we're talking about things uh, just kind of slowing the aging process or having minor impacts on reversing aging. But this uh, cellular reprogramming is probably going to be the, the thing that really kicks us into that real potential of uh, true age reversal. Incredible, Dan. Absolutely fascinating and uh, really, really interesting to hear about, um, if I'm pronouncing it right, semaglutide as well. I'm imagining that, especially for people who have dysregulated insulin sensitivity, would potentially be very profound and impactful for cognitive performance. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, um, I mean... I was talking, I was giving a talk at the age management medical group, one of the medical conferences on uh, age rejuvenation. And I was talking to another uh, uh, physician that has been doing age management for as long as I have. And she was telling me that prior to COVID, because I had mentioned the plasmapheresis and the young plasma in, in my talk. And she said prior to COVID, she had gone and to a company that was doing uh, young plasma, they, they subsequently were shut down by the FDA because it's not really approved. Uh, you have to do it under an uh, IRB. But uh, she had that done. And then six months later, she repeated her epigenetic age. And, and, you know, it's one thing to repeat it like after, right after it happens, because you've already got young factors in there. So you're probably going to pick up on those. But six months later, and she tested over 10 years younger than she had been on the test prior to, to that. Now, that doesn't mean she's 10 years younger, but it means that the needle's moving in the right direction. And 10 years is huge when we talk about the changes in methylation age, because methylation age is really the, the biological clock that is, um, that is ticking on us. That is, that is absolutely fascinating. You mentioned as well post-COVID brain and being able to see the stark pre and post contrast with EEG. A lot of our clients and people in general at the moment obviously are suffering from long haul COVID and post COVID brain. I'm curious if you woke up tomorrow with long haul COVID, uh, knowing everything, you know, what would be your first sort of three to five moves to try and uh, recover your, your brain, your performance, your energy back to pre COVID brain. Yeah. I mean, the, the first thing, First thing to really do, I mean, if you're serious about this and it's having a significant impact is, is get your brain mapped, get a brainwave map with an EEG that can, can look at areas where it's not optimized. Um, also, neuroinflammation ongoing is, is a common factor in uh, long COVID. And um, we found that low-dose naltrexone uh, has been working really well to minimize the, uh, the inflammation that people are getting. The... Um, the other thing we do is um, electrical brain stimulation. So we'll use either AC current, DC currents, transcranial magnetic stem, 
uh, along with global PEMF, um, and we'll we'll run that. Um, and we we do have a, a COVID protocol that uh, we we've, we've worked out based on what we've seen with our own clients. So we were seeing this, and we had implemented this before all the data really came out on the brain and, and COVID. And you, you just in the last, what, three weeks, there's been all these articles on the, the impact of the brain. Even mild COVID had significant impacts on the brain. And they saw, uh, I think the big UK study, they saw a 0.3% loss of volume in the brain. And that doesn't sound like much, 0.3%, but that's actually huge when you look at it. Um, and within the next 20 years, we'll probably see a tsunami of dementia um, if, if we don't address this. So it's really important. I mean, if you're having ongoing memory issues, finding words, you know, smell, dysfunction, visual dysfunction. Um, and there was a recent study that the people who got um, COVID uh, in the eye I don't know if you know of anybody that's had that, but I had two clients that got it. It was just, they had like a red eye um, or pink eye, they, uh, it, what it looked like, but it was most likely COVID eye and uh, they're finding significant uh, issues long-term for people that have had that. So all this stuff is coming, coming out right now. And the majority of people, I mean, you know, you're talking about 70% of people are gonna resolve those symptoms over time, but we can accelerate that recovery process typically or, uh, or the people who have it chronically that aren't getting rid of it, uh, you know, start looking around for some uh, neurostimulation because that's been the thing that we've really noticed as the biggest needle mover um, in our own clients and having the befores before COVID EEGs on all of our clients was, was really nice to be able to then reassess their post COVID EEG and then institute a protocol and then do the EEG again and see if we had achieved that. So we were getting both symptomatic relief, but we're also seeing the positive changes in, in the queue. That is, that's fascinating. Uh, the mention as well of low, low dose naltrexone is, is really fascinating for neuroinflammation. So I'm curious if you could break down what low dose naltrexone is and then a little bit more context on the uh, brain stimulation approaches would be really helpful. Um, maybe specifically differentiating between neurofeedback and what, what intervention you've found to be successful for COVID and also where people can learn more about that and potentially um, undergo an intervention like that. Let's start off with the brain, brain stuff because these brain stimulation protocols are, are really where we've, we've had huge impact. So what we do is we do the brain mapping and we, we spend a lot of time interviewing the client and then we do cognitive testing on them. Um, once they have their brain mapped and we get with a psychologist, um, my wife and I are both approved to read EEGs, but just because we don't do a huge volume of them, we want somebody who looks at them in several a day. And so we get on a call with them. We go over what the patient's experiencing, what their symptoms are, you know, what they'd like to improve upon. And she can look at it and identify areas where, where she's seeing that this can, this can have an impact. And then she sets up, she gives us feedback, gives us a specific protocol just for that person of stimulation to the brain. And sometimes it may be stimulation to increase activity in certain areas. Uh, sometimes it's to decrease, sometimes it's both. Uh, so we, we have people with high beta, they're the very, we call them beta heads. They're the very uh, anxious, nervous people that are constantly, constantly moving. And, um, and we, we can adequately get that turned down through neurostimulation. But one of the things that we do with that that has been really amazing is we combine the training with ketamine nasal spray. So right before they do training, they do two, two squirts of the ketamine nasal spray. And we've been able to accelerate the process of, um, of embedding these new patterns because the, the ketamine will disrupt what's called the default mode network in the brain, which is this, uh, it's where we put all of our patterns and, and it's designed to keep things very efficient. So the more times you do a repetitive task, then it suddenly gets locked into the default mode network and you don't even have to think much about doing it. It just happens. Um, 
We, but that can also cause a depression program and anxiety program. So you don't want any of those. But when we disrupt that default mode network, it allows the brain to say, okay, let's look around for other options. So it starts like looking around. Uh, I was doing an interview with Bo Lotto the other day. Uh, he's a uh, neuroscientist researcher. And uh, he said, it's like you have a river running and along that river, you have these little whirlpools and eddies. So the river's running at this constant rate and you're always gonna have these whirlpools and eddies that are consistent. These, this is the default mode network. And so if we drain it and then start the water back again, it will reestablish those, those eddies and, and whirlpools. But if you take that river and you shake up the riverbed, suddenly the, the brain can find new pathways, new ways of, of doing things that may be more efficient than the way that they had locked in previously. Uh, so we'll, we'll do either AC, uh, AC stimulation with AC current, we'll use a DC current, we'll use a transcranial magnetic stimulation current. It, it all just depends on what we're trying to achieve with the individual. That's the main thing. So um, are we, we trying to do x then we will use this protocol with with this one or we're trying to do y then we'll use this protocol now the um getting to that that neuroinflammation piece i mean now trexone is what they call an opiate antagonist which means it uh it, it kind of works at the brain to prevent uh the opioid receptors from from being targeted so they've used this in uh, alcoholics to reduce their, their behavior, but this is really on the, on the higher side of it. Um, but one of the things that was discovered with it was that it diminishes neuroinflammation. I mean, this is a, an off-label use of it, but um, there's a lot of people using it in neuroinflammation right now and having good results. I mean, you know, it's, it's like all those, those off-label medications that people will say, oh, it works for this, this, and that. I mean, now, Trexone, if you search the internet, it works for everything, um, which I know isn't true, but um, I have seen the actual uh, results with the neuroinflammation. Um, after I had heard about it for that purpose, um, we started doing it, and then we get to see the feedback from, from our clients and the changes in their uh, cognitive function and their, and their brain waves. So that's why we like that. Does it take a while to work down the naltrexone or is it? Oh, uh, no, no, not generally, generally, I mean, within three days of starting it, they they notice some, uh, some improvement if it's going to work for them. Um, so within three days of starting it, they'll, they'll start noting improvement. I've had people notice it even the first day they took it. Wow. That's fascinating. And then on the electrical stimulation front, if someone's wanting to explore doing that for a variety of different reasons, what would be what is a good next step to be able to actually undergo an intervention like that for folks who are listening? Well, most people right now are, are still doing uh, neurofeedback and there, there is a role for neurofeedback, but um, we did that for years. And what we found is, you know, you have to do 40, 50 sessions to, to really get the brain to move uh, and hold the pattern. And uh, with the neurostimulation, um, one is it doesn't take very long. It, uh, it's not, uh, just depressingly boring <laughs> in neurofeedback you have to watch a screen and you know you'll when your brain wave gets in the right pattern the plane will fly and then when it isn't in the ideal pattern the plane stops so that's how it's training the brain and that but you have to like pay attention with neurostimulation we just we just put people on a, uh, a breath pacer and we stimulate the brain while they follow the breath pacer uh, so it's really cool because we, we get them in great HRV while we're also getting the stimulation. So the system is really, uh, really getting jazzed up with, with all aspects of it. Uh, but, you know, neurofeedback does work. Uh, neurostimulation generally only takes 10 sessions and we can do two a day with those because they're only like 20, 30 minutes. Um, but there's not many people doing neurostimulation right now in the United States. Um, it's, it's kind of a fairly new uh, toy for us to be using in the, uh, in the biohacking world when it comes to that. I mean, there's a lot of people doing research on it, but from a clinical standpoint, it's, uh, it's just not, not ubiquitous right now. Got it. 
Got it, Dan. Thanks for that breakdown. The final thing I want to ask you about, and then we'll go to the very last question, uh, is stem cells, which I feel are one of the most used buzzwords or phrases within this space. A lot of people don't know what they are or whether they're any use or whether they're safe. And I'm curious if you could give us a quick breakdown just on your take on stem cells, where they're useful, if they're useful, and whether you all use them as well. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a triggered question. <laughs> it's, it's, it can be triggering um, because there's people who swear by them and there's people who are like, eh, not that great. Um, I think there's a yes and a no. They're great when you're talking about joint injections or local injections of the stem cells to create a response. The people that are using stem cells intravenously, um, I don't think those are viable. Um, I mean, you'll get a bit of an effect, but the, the cells are so big, they're going to get stuck in the lungs on the first pass. So they're not going to the system to, to go to areas where, where they can migrate, which is what a lot of people argue about. Um, but they're just getting stuck. Now, generally these stem cells will live two or three days. And during that time, they're going to secrete some uh, factors into the blood. And even, even when they're lodged in the lung, they can still do that. And so you're getting some of those factors and there may be some benefit there uh, from that. But the, the science is still undecided on, on that piece of it. The injection piece, uh, pretty, pretty clear. Um, but what those stem cells are secreting are exosomes. Uh, they're little tiny fatty packets that contain the microRNAs, the mRNAs, and other proteins that are being sent out around the cell, around the body to signal the body of what to do, to tell cells what's going on elsewhere. And, um, and so a lot of people are actually using intravenous exosomes instead of the stem cells. And they'll use the stem cells for the joint injections and, and the musculoskeletal pieces uh, and use the exosomes uh, from, from stem cells. So these are these packets and you can get 4 billion of those in one little CC that, that you inject into the body and, and they it will circulate all the way throughout the body and can migrate into other areas. So I'm biased. I mean, I have a definite preference towards exosomes and um, I just I have not seen good enough data on the, um, on the stem cells at this point. Got it. Thanks for that breakdown as well, Dan. That makes sense. And I've been hearing more and more about exosomes as well. The, the final question, Dan, uh, that we like to ask guests is a question about a question. Um, and the question is, if you could click your fingers and instantly have all of the randomized control trials done to fully and legitimately answer any open question you have, what would that question be that you would have answered instantly? <laughs> uh Whew. I don't think my question can ever be answered though. Uh, the, what is consciousness is, is my question. So, I mean, we can do all these tests and everything, but it's, it's not going to, not going to give us the answer. Uh, you know, I just, I just want to enjoy the experience. Uh, I mean, I want to go through life and say, I truly experienced it. You know, Nietzsche used to call, he had the, the Ubermensch or the Overman. That was the person who took the risks for the, for the rewards. And, and I look at that as, you know, you, you live on the edge so that you can experience things that are just at the edges of human potential uh, as we know it. And, and that's, a, that's a line that keeps spreading, uh, getting greater and greater. Uh, so really just living life and enjoying it. I mean, not just, it's not about just pursuing happiness. Uh, it's, it's having joy and uh, having a life of excellence where you can experience sadness, but you experience it to its most emotional depths. Um, it's painful when you do it, but when, after you're done with it, you're like, wow, that was almost orgasmic. Um, but you also get the bliss on the other side, that's even better than what you had before. So you can experience this whole range of emotions. This is the Ubermensch, he seeks that out. And Nietzsche uh, also referred to um, last man, they called it the last man. And this is the people that choose to minimize pain and maximize comfort throughout their life, which is the majority 
of our population around the world. It's a boring life, but it's a safe life for most people. And, uh, and that's what they want. For me, for my clients, none of them want that. My clients want to truly live the experience and, and push those limits of human potential to see what's possible. Love it, Dan. Thank you so much for this. It's been a phenomenal breakdown on some of the cutting edge tools out there and the amazing work you're doing. So I appreciate it. And where can folks find out more about you and all the work you're doing? Um, at uh, appearonzoi.com, A-P-E-I-R-O-N-Z-O-H.com. Uh, that's our, our main website. Um, and, you know, a lot of people will ask me, uh, you know, for financial resources are not optimized. Cause I mean, we do a lot of stuff. I mean, we're spending uh, 20 plus thousand a year per client and our programs run 24 to 60 K um, and it's not accessible for a lot of people. So we put out videos, we put out uh, educational pieces, but we're actually just launching a, a new telehealth program at an affordable rate for specific categories of work. Like uh, our first program is the body composition program. And then we've got a, female uh, health optimization program and then we've got a preconception we do a lot of preconception and pregnancy work with with couples getting them prepared to really have the optimal opportunity to maximize the baby's outcome uh, so we're going to have all those in a telehealth platform called morebeing.com so uh, more hyphen beingcom um, that it's actually launching um, in three days um, but that's that work is done with the physician and the and the lifestyle coaches that we we use, and uh, we're excited about it because a lot of people don't have access to like the uh, semaglutide. Uh, I mean, most docs don't even know that exists, and yet it's the best drug on the market for for weight loss that I've ever seen without stimulation uh, and other things in the age rejuvenation industry. There's a lot of people that just they read about these things and they want them, but they can't access them like, um, like the, um, the satinib for a senolytic or the rapamycin. Uh, they don't have access to them because the docs will say, yeah, I have no idea what that is and I'm not going to prescribe it for you because I'm not treating anything um, is the, the look they get. So when we put this as a, a telehealth platform, it'll open up a access for people who didn't have that ability before. Amazing. Well, thanks so much for your time, Dan. Appreciate it. And uh, I know everyone's going to have loved listening. Well, thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. If what you've heard on Flow Research Collective Radio has been helpful, please consider doing us a solid and leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this. Reviews help us connect to a wider audience so we can get these peak performance principles out to more people. Thank you.